Last week, I wasn't here and uh, for Williamsburg and for Somerset. I, I just got through bragging a little bit on Ethan Carnahan, who preached here, but also uh, Jacob, our student pastor in Somerset, uh, preached last week in Somerset, and Will, um, our new campus pastor in Williamsburg, Will Zick, uh, he preached last week's message in Williamsburg, and uh, last week, three incredible uh, preachers uh, preached three incredible messages, and I think we ought to put our hands uh, together and thank them for that. That was, that was amazing. Uh, so <clears throat> they gave me a little bit of margin to be gone last week uh, because we took our annual uh, family ski trip that we take every January. We go with some good friends of ours and, and their kids. And uh, this year uh, we went to Colorado and we were skiing a mountain that we'd never been on before. And, and this year was Allison's first year back to skiing after she had to have knee surgery the year before because of a knee injury she suffered from skiing. So she had to set out uh, in 2023, but she got to get back in the game in 2024. So we all kind of started the day skiing together, and I knew we were going to have to, you know, take it slow and cautious to kind of see, you know, how Allison's knee was going to respond. And, and so we were all skiing together, and after skiing together for the first part of the morning, um, we all kind of got separated because you ski at different paces and all of that. And, and so, you know, you know, me and Allison and the boys, we did a few runs uh, together, and the McLaughlins, they were with their family skiing, and then, and then we hooked back up a little bit later, and uh, it ended up just being me and Shepard and Grayson and Pruitt, um, the McLaughlin son, and uh, so the four of us went skiing together because Allison was like, hey, I've got my feet under me. Uh, you guys can just go conquer the mountain, do, do whatever you want to do, go wherever you want to go, and so we did, and, and, and that was good to hear, and uh, so we went off and, and we started to do our thing. And uh, Shepard and Pruitt are just great skiers. And I told them, hey, lead the way. And the only thing I ask is whenever you come to a sign, uh, just stop. Uh, because we'll need to know the best path forward because we've never been on this mountain before and, and we're really not familiar at all. Uh, I would ski back with Grayson over here. Grayson's 10 and, and Grayson's a great skier, uh, but like his dad, he kind of likes to go a little bit more controlled and, and not risk things too much. Uh, I didn't want to come back to church in a cast. And, and so we were back there and uh, the boys, Pruitt and Shep, would wait for us and, and then we'd go a little bit further and go a little bit further. But something happened, unfortunate series of events, I guess. Uh, they did and see some signs that were warning us, hey, uh, you may not want to go forward. And uh, what's to come is a little bit treacherous. It's perhaps a little bit dangerous. And, and so by the time Grayson and I got to Shepherd and Pruitt, they were kind of wait, waiting at the edge of what I could only describe as an almost cliff. And, and, and so, you know, I got there and I skied up to the edge and I looked down and I thought to myself, okay, um, I think I can do this, and that's just kind of how I'm wired. I, I probably couldn't, but I, at least I wanted to tell, I think I could do this, but I don't know. I'm the only adult in this ski group, and one of these kids are not my kids, and, and so I, I'm thinking, okay, what is, what is the best thing to do right now? What is, what is the most wise thing to do? What is the most responsible thing to do? And so I looked at the boys, and, and they were itching to go down it. Uh, and, and, you know, I guess, you know, they just don't have the good sense yet. And, and so I, I looked at the boys and I said, okay, we're not going to do this, but I'm about to teach you a lesson that if you will heed it, it will serve you well for the rest of your life. Because what we're about to embark on is what I will call the walk of shame. <laughs> but put in a better light, the walk of humility. I said, boys, take off your skis. What? Yeah, take off your skis, put them over your shoulder, and we are going to hike through these woods, and we are going to get to safer ground. Um, and, and here's the thing. It had snowed over a foot the night before. It had snowed several inches before we ever got there. So the snow is very, very deep. So here we go. I'm leading the way. The snow's up to my knees. For Shep and Gray, or for Shep and for Pruitt, the, the snow's up to their thighs. For poor Gray, it's up to like his chest. And, 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 and it's just, it's so difficult. And, and so, you know, I actually captured some video because it was terrible. I mean, it was horrible. It was, it was painful. I told him, I said, guys, this is going to be inconvenient. This is going to be uncomfortable. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to be painful. I caught a little bit of footage. Uh, this is at the very end. Uh, Pruitt and I and Shepard have already made it, but Shepard decided to be a good brother and go back and carry the skis for his brother. Uh, because Grayson, 
He said, Dad, I fell every single step. Every step I fell. And, and of course, you know, his heart's about to explode. My heart's about to explode. Pruitt's over there. And, and we're still waiting on Gray because you can just tell how hard this is. I mean, there's so much snow. We've been tracking through these freaking woods for minutes. I mean, it's horrible. Uh, the only thing that I could, you know, encourage myself with is you must have a good heart. And if there were any plaque ready to break, it would have broke, say, about there. Uh, because it was just difficult. And so, you know, Gray, it takes him a minute. But he finally gets up here. And, of course, there's sound on my phone that I took this video with. But he falls, and I'm like, Gray, how is it? It's terrible. How do you think it is? And, and so, you know, after we all kind of got our, you know, composure back and we lowered our heart rate and we got our breathing under control, um, the four of us were, were just sitting there and we were chilling out and we were kind of laughing about it and talking about it. And, and here's a picture of the four of us. And uh, we're, we've been camped there for about 10 minutes now. And, and, and so as we're camped there, I told him, I said, boys, you remember that lesson that I told you about? Um, you know, this walk of shame, this walk of humility. Here's the takeaway. Here's the takeaway for all, all of us, and here it is. Oftentimes, doing the responsible thing, the right thing, and the best thing is rarely the easiest or most convenient thing to do, but you should do it anyways. I said, that's the lesson. Don't ever forget it. And so, that's a lesson for all of us today. And it goes hand in hand with what we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks because we've been in this series called Learning to Count. And we've been talking about the importance of today, uh, this day, this very day, the importance of today. And, and we've been kind of immersing ourselves into one particular powerful and practical insight that comes out of the words of Moses. He, he wrote a Psalm, Psalm 90, verse 12. And there's one particular idea, this framework, this mentality, this attitude that, that he says we should all live by. He says, Teach us to number our days, God, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And this is more than a prayer. This is a way to live life. This is a way to approach life. This is, this is a framework for our thinking. This is an attitude of our heart and mind. Teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And so Moses' advice, if you've not been with us, is, hey, count your days so your days will count. Count your days so your days will count. Count your days so you just don't exist. Count your days so that you actually live. Uh, your life matters. My life matters. Your life matters. So you might as well live it in such a way that it mattered that you lived. Your life matters. And you might as well live life in such a way that it's going to matter that you lived. And so Moses, he says, this is a great way to live your life is just to count your days. And he knew that when we count our days, something really big happens. Uh, it, it creates a sense of urgency. It creates a sense of necessity that we got to live while we have the opportunity. We got to seize the moment and we've got to live life today because we've only got so many days and we have no idea how many days we have. So we just need to live today. And as we count our days, it helps us not to waste our days because it whispers to us, today is a chance to live, to live life, to enjoy life, to savor life, to share life, to soak all of life up that we can and to celebrate it, to commemorate it, to make it matter and make it count. Uh, last week, we kind of talked about the idea that today moves us past the past. It moves us past yesterday. Uh, when we count our days, no matter what happened yesterday, we're reminded we got to leave yesterday behind. We're also reminded that tomorrow isn't promised. So we got to live today. And we shouldn't forfeit our lives to the things that rob us of life. Life's too short for pettiness, for bitterness, unforgiveness, selfishness, immaturity, grudge holding, you know, all of that. Life's too short. So in remembering that one day we will die, we also remember that we should live today. When we remember that we'll die someday, we remember that we should live today. The idea being, the framework being, that today is the most important day of your life because yesterday can't be changed and tomorrow may never come. So today is the most important day of our life because you don't know and I don't know what choice I can make today, what choice you may make today, what conversation we could have today, what opportunity may find us today, that if we respond correctly to it, if we seize the opportunity, if we leverage today, we have no idea the trajectory of our lives as a result of that, of that choice, of that conversation, of that opportunity. So today is the most important day of our life. Yesterday is yesterday. Tomorrow, who knows if it's even going to come to not, come or not. And if tomorrow may not come, then I want to live today in such a way 
that I'm happy I live that way. And if tomorrow does come, I wanna live today in such a way that tomorrow I'll be glad I lived this day the way that I chose to. And so Moses says this because the, the principle and, and, and kind of the insight and we could call it the wisdom uh, that Moses has gained over the course of his life is that Moses realized that you can't control when you die, but you can control how you live. You, you can't control when you die, but you can control how you live. And, and so how I live and how you live, that's on you and that's on me. How we choose to live this day and the next day if we get it and all the days that we're allowed to have. One day how we live today will become a collection of days that ultimately will shape and influence how we look back and evaluate and think about the life that we lived. Um, there, there's a really uh, interesting kind of entertaining book called God, I'm Bored. Uh, and Eileen uh, Guter, she kind of you know, writes with humor and she says, you know what, when it comes to life, you can live life on bland food so as to avoid an ulcer. You can drink no tea or coffee or other stimulants in the name of health. You can go to bed early, stay away from nightlife, avoid all controversial subjects so as to never give offense. You can mind your own business and avoid involvement in other people's problems, spend money only on necessities, save all you can. Yes, you can do that. And you can still break your neck in the bathtub and it'll serve you right. Now, her, her idea laced in humor is this. Don't spend your entire life waiting to live. Don't spend your entire life waiting to live. Live today. And that kind of brings us back to the words of Moses. He says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And the reason that we count is we get wisdom. And when we live with wisdom, we live life aiming at the best possible ends and we adapt, we adapt the best possible or adopt the best possible means to the best possible end. And that's what the scriptures call wisdom. And here's the thing about wisdom. Wisdom's all about better. Some of us, we love the idea of better, and we should. We should be wired for better. Wisdom is all about better. Wisdom makes us better. It makes us better at life. And it makes life itself better. And when Moses says, count your days that you may gain wisdom, he's saying, don't forget, better is possible. Better's possible for you, better's possible for me, better's possible for all of us in all the areas of our life because when you count your days, you get wisdom and wisdom's all about better. And so today I wanna talk about an aspect of this wisdom that as we count our days, will make our lives better and it will make us better at life. And, and here's the thing, let me just warn you. The application of this little strand of wisdom that we're gonna talk about today, it's rarely convenient it's seldom comfortable, and sometimes it's painful. But like on the ski slope, when you gotta turn around and you gotta take some tough walking through the woods and up a mountain, even though it's uncomfortable, even though it's inconvenient, and even though it's painful, it's always gonna be worth it. And so the wisdom that I wanna talk about today is taking responsibility for our life. Because this is an act of wisdom. Taking responsibility for our life is an act of wisdom that comes as a result of counting our days. This is where better begins. Better for you, better for me, better for all of us. When we learn to take responsibility for our life, we decide to take responsibility for our life, that's where things begin to get better, even if we can't perceive that better is happening in that moment. Uh, this is something that oftentimes it feels like it shrinks our life, that, that it constricts our life, but it's actually something that enlarges our life, it deepens our life, it enriches our life. Taking responsibility for our life makes us stronger, makes us healthier, and in many ways, in the most substantial of ways and significant of ways, it can make us happier. Taking responsibility for our lives is an act of wisdom because taking responsibility for your life and me taking responsibility for my life it's something that only I can do. It's something only that you can do because we alone are responsible for our life. Uh, matter of fact, I think it would be really good for all of our churches right now. Let's just say this, this last statement out loud. We alone are responsible for our life. This time, like we mean it. We alone are responsible for our life. Well, what this means is that no one else can be responsible for my thinking, Nobody else can be responsible for my emotions. Nobody else can be responsible for my choices. Nobody else can be responsible for my actions. That's on me and that's on you. Nobody else in your life 
can be responsible for the way that you think, the way that you feel, the things that you choose to do or not do, and nobody else can be responsible for your individual actions. That's on you, and that's on me. Now, we see this idea of we alone are responsible for our lives. We see it beginning at the very start of the scriptures in the book of Genesis. And, and you, you know this story, many of you. Adam and Eve, God creates Adam and Eve, places them in the garden, and he gives them the gift of free will. He gives them the gift of choice. And with freedom of choice comes the implied need for personal responsibility. Because when you have the freedom to make your own choices, that implies that you must also exercise and I must exercise personal responsibility. God told Adam and Eve, he says, I want you to rule over creation. That's responsibility. And then God, in telling them, hey, I'm giving you responsibility, I'm also giving you free choice in your responsibility. Uh, personal responsibility, don't ever forget this, you know, may even want to write it down. Personal responsibility requires free will. If there's no free will, if somebody else is making your decisions, if somebody else is making your choices, then you're not personally responsible. But personal responsibility requires free will, and free will requires personal responsibility. That's the underpinning of the human existence. That's how God created us. That is the human architecture of this world, that we have been given free will, and with free will comes personal responsibility. With personal responsibility comes free will. So God said, hey, I'm giving you the whole garden, but there's one tree that you can't eat of. And he says, it's your responsibility to make the choice of the trees that you eat from and don't eat from. But I'm telling you, there's one that if you eat from it, you're going to surely die. It's dangerous. Don't dare go and eat from that tree. And so the choice was clear and the stakes of that choice was clear. And it was Adam and Eve. It was our first parents. It was their own personal responsibility to exercise their own free will in the best possible way, in the wisest possible way, to choose the wise thing, to choose the good thing, to choose the right thing, to choose the best thing. And so God, you know, he outlined the playing field. He kind of drew the borders of the field and he says, okay, I'm giving you free will and I'm giving you personal responsibility. And what did they choose? They, choose, they chose to eat from the tree that God told them not to eat from. They exercised their free will. They practiced irresponsibility because they didn't make the wise choice, the good choice, the right choice, the best choice. And here's the thing. Whenever you and whenever I act in irresponsibility, we always undermine relationships. Happens every single time. We undermine our relationship with God. We undermine our relationship with one another. And then when people who don't take responsibility, when people refuse to take responsibility, after they've undermined a relationship, here's what we tend to do, just like Adam and Eve. I mean, it's a parable for life as, as we see it play out all the time. We retract. When I'm irresponsible and I undermine relationships, I retract, I retreat, isolate, because that's what irresponsibility leads us all to want to do. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They went and hid from God, and then God comes and says, hey, Adam, where are you? And, and, you know, God says, what's going on? You know, not as if God needed information, but he's, he's asking leading questions. Did Adam take responsibility for what just happened? No. If you know the story, of course not. What did Adam do? He blamed God. God, this is your fault. It's not my fault. I'm not to blame, you're to blame. And, and then, you know, when he thought, well, maybe God's not the best person to blame, he looks at his wife and says, well, my wife's always good to blame. And, and so he just looks at Eve and says, I'll, it's Eve, this, this woman you gave me. I was content naming the animals. I didn't need a woman, I didn't, need, I didn't ask for a wife, I didn't even know what a wife was. You gave me a wife and I lost a rib. I'm the victim here. I've done nothing. And, and then, you know, Eve steps in and says, no, it's not me. And she blames the serpent. And what started then continues now. When we act irresponsibly, our first instinct is to find someone to blame, to find something to blame. And whenever we blame someone or something that we have to be personally responsible for, or we should take personal responsibility for, we place ourselves in the posture of the victim. And that's what Adam and Eve both try to pretend to be. Adam says, I'm a victim. You did this. She did this. Eve says, no, I didn't do this. I'm the victim. He, the serpent, did this. 
And that's what irresponsibility does. It always causes us to want to blame something or someone. And when we blame something or someone for what we ourselves did, we try to play the victim. Somebody else made me do it. These circumstances that I, I, were raised, I was raised in, those circumstances are to blame. My family that I came from, that's to blame. Yeah, I, I've just had one hard thing happen to me in life after the other. Some people, they were born with a silver spoon. And I, we didn't even have a silver spoon. We didn't even have a wooden spoon. We had our hands. It, uh, that's how difficult it was. And, and we blame our upbringing. We, bring our, we blame our family. We blame the nation. We blame people. We blame cultures. We blame society. But Adam and Eve, we know, were responsible, even though they acted irresponsibly and even though they tried to blame their way out of it. And many of us have been tempted to do the same ever since because irresponsible people blame things and people for their irresponsibility. It's just, it's an unfortunate thing that we do. Irresponsible people want to blame things and people for their irresponsibility. It's easier to blame. It's easier to make excuses than it is to take responsibility. It's easy to point at your mom or your dad or your brother or your sister or your teacher or your coach. It's easy to point at them. It's easy to point at that and to say, that's the reason. That's the reason I did what I did. That's the reason I think what I think. That's the reason I feel what I feel. That's the reason. I'm not to blame. I don't have any responsibility in this matter. So irresponsibility, it creates a temptation to want to blame our irresponsibility on somebody else. And here we are in America, 21st century America, and, and we live in a culture that's growing more irresponsible all the time. And it's not only tolerated, but it's almost celebrated. And in many cases, it's rewarded within our society. A lot of parents are raising their children, children who are dependent when they're first born. But the goal is to take our dependent children who are born and trusted into our care and to raise them to become independent. That's the goal. But we have a culture that raises dependent children and then creates dependent adults. And sons and daughters who are adult, who are looking at mom and dad to still pay the bills, looking at mom and dad to step in and to bail them out when they act irresponsibly, to make sure that they don't have to suffer any of the consequences of their own choices or their own decisions or their own way of thinking. And that's kind of the culture we're in. People make irresponsible financial decisions and assume somebody else is gonna pay for it. Family will pay for it, friends will pay for it, the government will pay for it. People choose to be irresponsible with their health and assume one day somebody will be there to take care of me. They'll be there to wait on me hand and foot because I refuse to take personal responsibility for my health, so I'm just gonna put my irresponsibility and make somebody else responsible for it. Some of the most leading causes of death in this country are preventable, but evidence of irresponsibility. Government, we got political irresponsibility that's neck deep in this country. We spend money we don't have. We don't care about borders. We just do all of these things that are just irresponsible. It doesn't even make sense. And then we just, we just blame, we just blame. We live in a culture of blame. Irresponsibilities on the rise, blames on the rise. There's a great statement that I came across. It says, it's not just that we don't teach people how to take responsibility for their own life. It's that in many ways, we actively discourage them from doing so. Woke culture, safe spaces, victimhood, each is a manifestation of a culture that has replaced individual responsibility with collectivist notions of injustice. And, and the point that he's trying to make in this is when you try to put everything under the banner of injustice, I've been slotted, we've been slotted, we were dealt the short end of the stick. We got a bad dealing of the cards. Whenever you put everything under the banner of injustice, you erode the idea of personal responsibility. And when you put everything under the umbrella of injustice, you give everybody an excuse and you give everybody someone or something to blame. Does injustice exist? Certainly. But is every bad situation that happens to someone a result of injustice? Absolutely not. Personal responsibility. It doesn't mean that you're responsible for every bad thing that happens to you. And it certainly doesn't mean that you're personally responsible for what other people have done to you or refuse to do for you. But it does mean that we are all responsible in how we choose to respond to what people did, what people said, what people failed to do. 
That's where our personal responsibility comes in. Uh, Jordan Peterson, he, he, wrote, he wrote about this at length, but I want to give you just a portion of this. He says, I've seen things you can't imagine. And if you're not familiar with him, he was a clinical psychologist, you know, in, engaged in personal counseling with people. He says, I've seen things you can't imagine. Horror shows you can't fathom. And people have been hurt in so many ways. And, and, and he could be talking about you. He could be talking about me, perhaps. On so many different dimensions, they've been hurt. Should they be bitter? Do they, do they have a reason to be bitter? On the surface, we would think, well, yeah, probably. We would understand it. Should they be resentful? Yeah, I, I can understand why they would be. Should they become violent? Well, I can understand why they would have a problem with anger in their temper. He says these things don't help. In the end, they have to struggle uphill despite their excess burden because the alternative is far worse. Yeah, you can get to the edge of the cliff and you can decide to go off, but you may not live to tell the tale. But to decide to struggle uphill, that's the wiser thing. That's the better thing. That's the wisest thing. That's the best thing. He says, you struggle uphill despite their excesses and their burdens because the alternative is far worse. This is the essence of responsibility. And in this responsibility, our lives find meaning. This is how one becomes a ship that can weather storms. Not by placing your power in things beyond your control, but by taking responsibility over things you can. And again, the idea that I think Moses would say, the wisdom that we get is we alone are responsible for our lives. And it's not unfair, though it may seem unfair. Um, Shepard, I hope you don't mind I tell you the story. I usually ask permission before I tell you a story, but um, I think he'll forgive me. Will you forgive me ahead of time? He's thinking about it. Okay, I'm gonna move on and ask you to forgive me afterward. But when Shepard was in preschool, he was in his last year of preschool, there was a little altercation that happened at preschool and, and he, he, he kind of mistreated this, this, this girl that was in his class. And, and when I was told about it by his teacher at the end of the day, and she said, you know, Shepard was a little bit mean uh, to this particular girl uh, during class today. And I was like, okay, all right. So I, I got Shepard in the car and I asked him about it and I said, okay, uh, what do you think the best thing that we should do about this? Uh, I said, did you apologize to her? And he's, well, no, I, I didn't really, you know, and, you know, he's in preschool. I mean, you know, he, he's just a, a little kid. And I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, I took him to the store and, and we bought a gift for the little girl. And I said, here's what you're going to do. I'm going to drop you off. I know where this, this girl's dad works and I'm going to drop you off at his office. You're going to walk in by yourself. You're going to knock on his office door and you're going to ask him for just a couple of minutes. And you're going to apologize to her father for the way that you treated her today and you're going to give this gift to him to take home to her as an apology. And then you can apologize to her the next day. And he was like, Dad, no. And some of you are thinking, what kind of heartless father are you? And, and, and it's like, you know, <clears throat> I didn't say I practice what I preach, just you know, or practice what I preach, maybe not what I do. Uh, but, you know, sometimes parents, we learn our own lessons. We learn it the hard way, but we see a better way for our kids. And, and so he did. He went in there, and um, he came out, and I said, did you do it? And he said, yeah. So why would you do something like that? Because it's all about taking responsibility. And, and taking responsibility involves the right thing, the best thing, you know, a good thing. And, and sometimes those things turn out to be the hard thing to do. It's the walking back up. It's the walk of humility. It, it, it's turning around when it would be easier maybe to go forward, but not perhaps the best. And so when it comes to personal, I know I'm spending some time on this, but we'll wrap it up here in just a moment. Personal responsibility is not just about you and it's just not about me. It's about the people around us. And, and here's the irony of it all. When we realize that what's best for me is really what's best for the people around me. It makes life a lot richer. It's not about what's best for me. It's what's best for the people around me. And what's best for the people around me turns out to be the best thing for me. And it goes hand in hand with what Jesus taught, that you love your neighbors, you love yourself, that you put other people's needs above yourself. You prefer other people over yourself. And again, it ties into what we're talking about because the impact and consequences of personal responsibility is rarely just personal. It wasn't for me out there on the ski slope. It was about three other people that I love and that I think are amazing. It was about them. And so I realized it's just not about me. If I just did what I wanted to do, if I wanted to prove a point, if I wanted it to be all about me, then that could have got us in some really bad places. And on the flip side, the impact and the consequence of personal irresponsibility is rarely just personal. And again, we understand how this plays out. 
Because when we're irresponsible, somebody has to pay the price. Somebody has to bear the burden. Somebody has to endure the consequences of our irresponsibility. And it's true in every area of life. When we are irresponsible, somebody else has to step in and be responsible for our irresponsibility. It's what happens. Take one of the biggest things going on in our culture right now, especially here in our part of the country. How many children are being raised by, grand, by, by grandparents? And you've seen this. You know this. You, you see your kids going to school and they're being raised by their grandparents. Why? Because somebody had to step in and be responsible for somebody else's irresponsibility because somebody always has to be responsible for somebody's irresponsibility. So it's not just about me. And so Moses says, count your days because today is the only opportunity that you have and I have to take responsibility for our lives. Doing the responsible thing will prevent regret tomorrow. Ethan, Jacob, Will talked about this last week. But doing the responsible thing today will create a better tomorrow. And that's where I want to camp out today because irresponsibility, you know what it does? It's predictable. It always leads to shame, resentment, regret, and anger. Because here's what happens. When I'm irresponsible with my life, I begin to see people who took responsibility for their life. And you know what the temptation is? I look at the hard work they were willing to do, and then I realize that I wasn't willing to do the hard work they were willing to do, and you know what? I resent them for it. And that's the culture we live in. You resent somebody else's success because they paid a price you weren't willing to pay. They put in the time you weren't willing to put in. They took the risk you were not willing to take. And then you look at them and you resent them and you malign them and you insult them. That's the culture we're in because that's the predictability of irresponsibility. Somebody stood up when we weren't willing. Somebody else dreamed while we got distracted. And then that resentment that we feel gives birth to shame. And that shame masquerades itself as anger, as frustration, as a chip on the shoulder. Because we know we could have, but we didn't. We could have, but we didn't. And then that shame robs us of life. And so this idea is that responsibility today gets rewarded tomorrow. Now, we talked about Israel last week and, you know, they left Egypt. Moses led them to the land of promise. They wandered for 40 years. But at the end of those 40 years, Joshua took over for Moses, and so where we left off last week, it's kind of where that story begins to go. And Joshua takes over, and they're going to go into the land of promise, into the land of Canaan. They're going to cross the river. And there's going to be a new vision for what tomorrow could look like and what it should look like. But what tomorrow is supposed to look like is inextricably connected to what Israel would choose to do in the present. How they would leverage today. Because how you leverage today, it will show up tomorrow. So in the book of Joshua, God shows up. He's talking to Joshua, the new leader. And, and with all the things that we've talked about, you know, kind of undergirding this, this particular text, just let me give this to you. He says, keep the book of the law always on your lips, Joshua. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Or to think about it another way, a bit more analytical, a little bit more in context, and a little bit more within the context of what we're talking about, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it today. Do this today. This is what you need to take responsibility to do today. Then, future consequence, you will be prosperous and successful. That's tomorrow. What you do today will show up tomorrow. Tomorrow is about what you choose or what you choose not to do today. Your tomorrow is about whether you and I choose to take responsibility for our lives today on the day that we've been given. So the text goes on. He, he says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law of my servant, you know, that Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. That purposeful statement that you may be successful wherever you go. You do this today so that tomorrow you may be successful wherever you go. So Joshua be courageous today, be obedient today, be focused today, be intentional today. And if you do so today, tomorrow you lay the groundwork for success. Tomorrow you lay the groundwork for breakthrough. And tomorrow you'll be glad you did that today. 
And, and so the message is clear. What you do today, what I do today, lays the groundwork for what you and I experience tomorrow. And again, the unfortunate applications <laughs> stare us in the face. It's true about finance. It's true about health. It's true about relationships. It's true about our career. It's true about our faith. You take care of your body today, it lays the groundwork for what you experience tomorrow. You treat your money the way you're supposed to treat your money today, it lays the groundwork for what you experience financially tomorrow. You invest in relationships today, it shapes the experience you have in those relationships tomorrow. You study hard today, you work hard today, you invest today, you sow today, you water today, and it lays the groundwork for harvest tomorrow. You count your days, you get wisdom, you take responsibility today because you know that it begins to shape tomorrow. He says, Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready. Preparation, put in the work. Do the deal. Do what has to be done. Do what should be done. done. Do what needs to be done. Get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give them, to the Israelites. And so, you know, they begin to do that. They begin to, you know, get ready, prepare. And then in chapter three, it says, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. So they put in some work. They've been leveraging today. They've been doing what they need, what they should, what they must today in preparation, in expectation, in anticipation of tomorrow. So they went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. And he tells them, he says, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, which is simply a picture of God's presence, God's promise, God's power. He says, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence, God's promise, God's power, when you see it begin to move, you follow. You begin to get in line. And, and his message was simply this. Follow the presence and the power and the promise of God. Follow it wherever it leads. It's the most important thing. And wherever it leads and whatever it costs you, you follow. If it leads you to a giant, hey, trust God that he's able to slay it. If, if he leads you to the sea, trust God that he can part it. If he leads you to a valley, trust God that he can lead you through it. So you follow him and you follow his power, his promise, and his presence. Because when you organize your life around God today, you're better positioned for tomorrow. It's just an elementary part of our faith. And this is what he's telling them. And this is what we're learning from this story. You organize your life around God, the values that God pronounces over our life, the truth that God pronounces over our life, the direction that God gives us. You organize your life around God today and you are better suited. You're better positioned for tomorrow. So Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. Consecrate yourself today. Prepare yourself today for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things among you, among us. Get ready today for what God wants to do in your life tomorrow. That, that's, that's what he says. He doesn't tell them to sharpen their swords. He tells them to prepare their hearts. He tells them to fill their minds. He, he points them towards tomorrow, and this is important. We were taught last week, don't get caught up in yesterday. You can't change it. Don't let the regrets of yesterday rob you of how you live today. He points them, not towards yesterday, because you can't do anything about yesterday. He points them towards tomorrow, because tomorrow is a powerful source of inspiration and motivation for living life today. And he's leveraging the power of hope. He's leveraging the power of expectation, anticipation, vision. Talk to me for a minute. Without vision, people what? Without vision, people what? They die. What's death? A lack of life. You have no vision for tomorrow. You can't possibly live life today. No vision for tomorrow. There's not much capacity to live today. Today was all they had, yes. But the hope of tomorrow was so powerful that it should lead them and lead us to make the most of today. Now, Israel had experienced some amazing things like some of you and your walk with God, your, your faith journey. God had done amazing things. He had rescued them from Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. He, he fed them with manna from heaven, water from a rock. Their shoes didn't wear out. He led them by fire by night and cloud by day. And, and Moses says, hey, or Joshua says to the nation of Israel, hey, we're gonna get ready today because tomorrow. He, he doesn't point them in the past. Because why? You can't live on yesterday. You can't live on yesterday's miracles. You can't live on yesterday's manna. You can't live on yesterday's work. Every day, 
is a new day to take responsibility for your life. Don't be like your ancestors, Joshua would say. They over-exaggerated yesterday. Oh, let's go back to Egypt. But as they over-exaggerated yesterday, they underestimated the power of today. And they let the momentous become monotonous and they let the fabulous become familiar and they became numb to God. And, and as they did so, their ancestors, they undermined their tomorrow. They got so caught up in yesterday, they forgot to leverage today. And Moses, Joshua says, we're not going to do that. I want you to see a wonderful vision for tomorrow. I want you to see the hope that tomorrow can bring. I want you to be motivated by that. I want you to be inspired by that. That it can be better. It can change. Things can pivot. There is better in front of you. And allow that understanding to create action, to take responsibility today. Their yesterday, their yesterday was proof of a better tomorrow but it was going to be contingent on what they did today. Yeah, draw faith from the past. Don't over-exaggerate the past. Don't make it worse than it is. Don't make it better than it is. But don't forget, the future is contingent on what they would do today. God had been faithful. God had been good. God had been present. But they couldn't coast on that. Today's prayers and today's decisions and today's habits and today's conversations and today's investments, today's discipline, today's faith, today's hard work, that's the hinge on which the future arrives. And so Joshua, he's learning lots about leadership. The people are learning a lot about faith. So what does it mean for us? We take this story and, you know, we, we draw out of it what we can draw. What does it mean for us to consecrate ourselves today, to prepare ourselves today? Well, certainly it means that we begin to understand that our life is bigger than just my life that I'm a part of a larger story, that I'm counting my days, and that every second of time is a gift from God that ultimately I can use as a gift to be given back to God. It's about the offer to go all in, to trust, to obey, to exercise big faith. Because those are the moments that become the great moments of life. It's Abraham laying Isaac down on the altar when it was the last thing that he wanted to do. It's Noah going out and cutting the first tree before he built the ark. It's Moses walking into Pharaoh's court and saying, let my people go. It's David pulling out the sling in front of Goliath. It's Peter getting out of the boat. It's this anticipation of what's going to happen that causes me to take responsibility and act today. It's the potential of tomorrow that inspires us to do the hard things today. You will be willing to do the hard things today if you're believing and you're confident and you're hopeful and anticipating that tomorrow, the hard work today will be worth it tomorrow. The price you pay today will be worth it tomorrow. The time in today will be worth it tomorrow. The hard work of today helps us to see more clearly the potential of tomorrow. There's no assurance. There's no promise but there's the potential, there's the anticipation. You can take care, I can take care of myself, but I have no promise of tomorrow. But if I'm given tomorrow, if I take care of myself today, I'll be glad I did it tomorrow. If you work hard today, even if tomorrow doesn't come, if it does come, you'll be glad you worked hard. And this is what he's trying to get us to understand. And so the next day, it says, the Lord said to, to Joshua, today, today I will begin because what you did yesterday, which was for them in the present, today. Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all of Israel so that they may know I'm with you as I was with Moses. In other words, what's happening today started yesterday. And that can be good news and that can be bad news. You think about it. The reality that you're living in today is connected to what you and I decided to do over the course of a lot of yesterdays. But today is an opportunity to change that if it needs to be changed or to undergird that and support that if those yesterdays were leveraged correctly. For Joshua and Caleb, they spent 40 years dreaming about this moment. They got 40 years of yesterdays that have, has brought them to this moment and the day has finally come and it was time to move forward. 
And the idea is that you can't separate yesterday from today. And you can't separate today from tomorrow. You've got to have the proper perspective for yesterday. You've got to have a hopeful anticipation, a vision of tomorrow, so that you can leverage today for all that it can be. And then the story ends this way. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed until the whole nation had completed the crossing of dry ground. You say, well, what's the story? They crossed over. They're getting ready to take occupation of the land that God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the overarching idea in this little passage of Scripture is that today is the architect of tomorrow. What we decide to do, what you decide to do or not do today, is drawing tomorrow's reality. It's building, it's constructing tomorrow's reality. The things that we say or refuse to say today, it's becoming the architect of tomorrow. The thoughts that I think today, the feelings that I allow myself to feel today, the choices, the actions, all of it today, it's the architect of tomorrow. So today matters. Our habits today matters. Our attitudes, our actions, our thinking, our emotions, our words today, it matters today. But you know what? It also matters tomorrow. So you and I, we should know that better is possible and we should have a vision of a better tomorrow, so much so that it energizes us to take responsibility and do what needs to be done, should be done, must be done today. To be responsible for what I can do today and learn to trust God with the rest. That's the idea. To be responsible for what you can do today and trust God with the rest. They had to prepare themselves. That was their work. Parting the river, God's work. Consecrating themselves today, doing what needed to be done, should be done, what must be done today, that was their work. That was their responsibility. Walking to the edge of the river, their responsibility. God, his responsibility was to part the water. And here's the thing. If they had been irresponsible for what they were supposed to do, why should they expect God to be responsible for his part when they chose to be irresponsible with their part? But you know what? We do that all the time. And I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's the beginning of a new year. And some of us need to hear it. We do this with our health. We do this with our, our bodies we're irresponsible. And then when our irresponsibility catches up to us, who do we want to bail us out? God. We pray about being short on money, the stress, the strain, but we're not responsible enough to save, to cut spending, to change the lifestyle that we've grown accustomed to. We pray about bad habits, but we're not willing to change anything. We pray about the mess that we're in. Mind you, it's the mess we got ourselves in and we want God to get us out of the mess. We're irresponsible so many times and we turn to God and say, God, would you take responsibility for my irresponsibility? You know what? Sometimes God is so good and so gracious. He does step in. But that's not how he desires us to live. For some of us today, we need to take responsibility today. Some of us need to take responsibility for our emotions, our thinking, our actions, our choices. Stop blaming everybody else. That resentment, that frustration that you've always got a finger, oh, it's him, it's her, it's my boss, it's my brother, it's my sister. I, I tell the boys all the time and they get tired of hearing me. No one has the power to make you feel anything. And we're gonna talk about it in the next series. I choose that, you choose that. So let's stop making excuses. Let's stop blaming. Say, that's just who I am, that's just how I am, that's how I was raised. It's my choice, no one else made me. It's my thinking, nobody else controls the way that I think or the way that I feel, only I 
me alone can take responsibility for my life and what goes on in my life. Failed relationships, failed friendships, Take responsibility. Some of us, that's what we need to do today. That, that's the message. Be responsible for what you can do today and trust God with the rest. And you know what? God, through his son, Jesus, he gives us the grace and the power to overcome what people did to us and what people said to us and how people betrayed us and how people broke our hearts. He gives us the grace and the power to move beyond that. We don't have to be defined by that. We don't have to be controlled by that. Some of us need to take responsibility for our faith, to grow it, to deepen it, to strengthen it to take responsibility for our health because everything spiritual we will do in this life is through a physical body. When it comes to life, when it comes to life, God seldom makes a way when we have made no effort. But something amazing happens when we do what we alone are responsible for and we do all the work and we walk to the edge of wherever it is that he's taking us. He will make a way because that's his responsibility. So let's take responsibility and let's begin to create a better tomorrow because of what we decide to do today. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for um, this text, the the wisdom in it, the application that's in it. Um, God, these words today, it's way above my level of living. Lord, I aspire to learn from this. I aspire to apply this. And God, I pray that all of us will count our days where we get the wisdom that says, I'm gonna take responsibility for my life today because I believe that it matters tomorrow, that better is possible tomorrow. And that if I do my part, God, we will trust that you'll do your part. And we believe that you can make a way when we also do our part and make the effort. That's on us. Making a way, that's on you. And we trust you with that as we do what we can do and trust you to do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, and everybody said.